Amen. Well, at this time, we're just going to get ready for the main course. Come on now. Um, I know this whole month we've been having couples come up here and share. And today, today it was going to be my wife and I that was going to be able to share today. But I don't know if you guys been here from, from the beginning of this month to now. Like we had powerful couples come up here, share their heart and what God is doing. And, and the women of God, they stepped it up. Come on. I'm nervous right now. My wife might break it off, and I hope I don't drop the ball. Nah. But, you know, I'm, I'm grateful to be here. I just want to thank Pastor Sister Sylvia, you know, for giving us the, the you know, opportunity to share behind the pulpit this evening. But no, without further ado, you know, I want to call up my beautiful, wonderful, amazing wife. She's going to share, and then I'm going to come back. Amen. God bless you, church. Are you guys excited to be in the house of God on a Friday night? I'm excited. Well, what an honor and privilege it is to be able to be up here with my husband and share the word of God to you tonight. Uh, I just want to thank God for my salvation, uh, for saving me. I want to thank my amazing leaders, our pastors, um, just for giving my husband and I the opportunity and um, I am nervous, but I'm just going to do this. Amen. <laughs> and um, what I want to talk about tonight is I want to talk about the greatest gift. The greatest gift. Amen. And this is something that God ministered to me this week. I was going through something. You know, how many of us go through something all the time, right? Well, I was going through some stuff and I was talking to God. You know, and this is what God gave me. And I said, okay, now I know what I'm going to share on Friday. <laughs> Amen. But I'm just going to go ahead and pray for the sake of time. And we're going to just get right into it. If we could just bow our heads in reverence. Amen. Heavenly Father, God, Lord, I thank you, God. God, we thank you tonight. We're so grateful, God, that you saved us, God, that you rescued us, God. God, and that, that you're with us, God. And I pray that you would... Just speak through me tonight that your Holy Spirit, God, will take full control, minister to every heart in this place, Lord. Change us, Lord. We don't want to be the same. I don't want to be the same, God. And I pray that your word would just change us and transform us. In Jesus' name we say, amen. Amen. And if you guys have your Bibles tonight, go ahead and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And we're going to be starting in verse 1. Amen? And the word of God reads, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clinging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long. It is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own. It is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not re rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believe all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. And I'm going to continue in verse 8. Love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man or a woman, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also I am known. And lastly, verse 13 says, And now abide in faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. 
And how many of you say you don't struggle with love? Like, you're the love guru. You, you love everybody. You're always, you know, just walking in love, right? No, right? We, I believe we all struggle with love, especially in the house of God. I'm going to say that. The chapter right before this, Paul was speaking to the church of Corinth, Corinthians. There was a lot of division going on. There was a lot of turmoil going on in Corinthians. And Paul just got in chapter 13, we see he just got right down to it. Because right before this, he was, they were speaking about gifts. And I know a lot of us, man, we have gifts. Or a lot of us, we, sometimes we come to church when we hear evangelists is coming. People are coming, right? We, we come because we want a miracle. We come because we want healing. We come because, you know, the, 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 the gift of tongues just falls upon us. And all that stuff is great. But if it's not with love, then it means nothing. It means nothing. And that's what Paul is trying to get the Corinthian church to understand. Because they were arrogant. They were puffed up. They, they couldn't love each other. They were fighting one another. They thought one another was better than the other person. But, but Paul had to come and tell them the truth. Paul had to come and rebuke the congregation. You know, and he had to remind them, the giftings are cool. Yes, it's a part of it, but all that stuff is going to pass away. And the one thing that's going to remain is love. Amen? And I want to look at verse 2 again. It says, though I have the gifts of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have faith that I can remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. You could prophesy. You could have faith to remove mountains. You could have faith to see miracles take place, right? You could have knowledge to preach, to teach, to do all these great things. You're a teacher. You're a preacher, right? You went to seminary school. I think I, think I said it right. I don't know. <laughs> all of that doesn't mean anything without the love of God. If you don't have the love of God inside of your heart. All those things are irrelevant, unimportant. You know, without love. The gifts of the Spirit are not the goals. I know a lot of us, especially in our time, in my generation, we're right now we're like in this like uh, sensational movement thing, right? Where people are getting like healings and, and, and demon, uh, people are getting like uh, delivered from demon possession, right? And a lot of times the people are focusing on that. And, and, and then we get it twisted. But then in our personal lives, we don't know how to love the person right next to us. You know, we don't know how to be patient and, and kind to the person right next to us. But we can't wait to go to church to see a miracle or to see somebody get delivered from a demon. You know, but, but then we, we, we can't even love people. And, and we can't think we're going to go to heaven if we don't have the love of God in, inside of us. That's what all of this is about. Right? Come on. They had their priorities mixed up, the Corinthian church. We have to be careful, church. Always keeping the main thing the main thing, which is love. And you're going to hear me say that word like more than 100 times in my, my preaching time. Love. We shouldn't be satisfied just with gifts. We shouldn't be satisfied with just hearing the prophecies of those who are gifted. Those things are great. And I'm not downing them. Because they go hand in hand. But we can't focus on those things as being the main goal. Because the main goal is love. Amen? What's the purpose of seeing a miracle performed if the goal isn't love? Like what, you know what I mean? We, want, we see a miracle because we love that person. We want to see them healed. We want to see them set free. And it's all in the name of God's love. And love. Meaningless. Everything is meaningless without love. Everything, what we, we always got to remember when we're serving in church, when we're in the kids ministry, when we're on the worship team, when we're doing all these things, they're great. But we have to always remember to do it from a place of love for people. Because if not, then we're just glorifying ourselves. We're just seeking the limelight. We're just seeking attention. Come on, I'm going to talk about it. <laughs> There are four different types of, um, there are four different meanings of love in the Greek, right? There's four, but I'm just going to focus on one, which is the word agape, because that's the type of love that Paul was referring to here in this scripture. 
And I did a little word study on the word agape. Love means it's unconditional, sacrificial love. Self-denial for the sake of another. Come on. And there's a little bit more I, I looked up. It says, biblical agape love is, a love is the love of choice, the love of serving with humility, the highest kind of love, the noblest kind of devotion, the love of the will, meaning intentional, a conscious choice and not motivated by superficial appearance, emotional attraction, or sentimental relationship. The love of Jesus. The same love that Jesus showed us is the same love we should be showing to others. The same love that God gave for us is the same love we should be giving in, in, while we're living on this earth, in this time, while we're walking with God, right? But it's not always like that. And I'll be the first one to say that it, I'm, I'm still learning every day and becoming like Christ. I ain't going to stand here and say I'm perfect and I got it all together. But every day God is teaching me how to love, but I'm open to it. I'm open. I see it. God rebukes me and I'm like, oh, but I see it. You know, and this is something God was ministering to my heart. And, and he's like, you need to learn how to love, Cora. No matter what they do to you, no matter what they say to you, no matter how they hurt you, no matter, you know, if they're hating on you, you still got to love them. Amen? Come on. I'm a, I, let me hurry up. Agape is not based on pleasant emotions or good feelings that might result from, you know, physical attraction or like a family bond. Agape chooses as an act of self-sacrifice to serve the recipient. From all of the descriptions of agape love, it is clear that true agape love is a sure mark of salvation. When you have true agape love, man, you, you got salvation. Because you, you found the, the answer, the key, the greatest gift is God's love. And then right here, I want to look at verse 3. It says, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. We can give everything that we have away, but without love, it means nothing. Imagine if the rich young ruler in the Bible, right, Jesus told him, give all your stuff away, come follow me. Imagine if he did give his stuff away, but he didn't have love in his heart, it would have meant nothing. And, I don't, you know, a lot of us can say, man, I'm in the church all the time. I'm sacrificing. I'm laying down my life. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. Well, that isn't enough. Do you have love, though? Because you do all that stuff, but do you have the love of God inside of your heart? Do you have agape love for the people, the ones that annoy you, the ones that rub you wrong, the ones that get on your nerves? Right? It's the truth. Even if I lay down my life in death, even if I say, let me be burned for Jesus, you know, and, and man, who's going to question that? Who's going to question me if I'm like, you know, go ahead, shoot me right now in the head because I love Jesus. That's great. But if I don't have love inside my heart, all of that means nothing. And you're like, wow, how could you say that? Like, you went out there, you sacrificed your life for God, you let those people kill you. But if I didn't have love in my heart, that would have meant nothing. And from the outside, it would have looked like I had a great walk with the Lord. Like, come on, who's going who's gonna to give their life, right? Wow, she gave her life for God, so she really must have been walking with the Lord. Yeah, but God knew that I struggled with loving people, so it meant nothing. My sacrifice, my martyrism, all of that stuff meant nothing. I'm trying, I don't know if I'm getting through to you tonight, but love, the greatest gift, the thing we should be focusing on and asking God to help us with is love, agape love. Come on, I'm doing good on my time a little bit. <laughs> Some Christians think, I already said that, but like, yeah, sometimes we're sacrificing, we're suffering for the Lord, we're doing all these things, and that is important. That is a part of being a Christian, you know, walking with the Lord. We're going to go through some stuff. We're going to go through some battles, but that's not the most important thing because the most important thing is love. So what kind of love should we have? And the Bible talks about it. Love suffers long. It is kind. It does not envy. It does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. It's not, it doesn't behave rudely. Come on, who knows some rude people? Ah, oh, come on. Does not seek its own. It's not provoked. 
thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, and bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. And right here, love suffers long. How many of you know that God suffered long for you? God's still suffering long for some of you guys. He hasn't came back yet because he's waiting for you. He's suffering long for you to change. He's suffering, waiting for you to get it right. He's waiting for you to get it together. He's waiting for you to let go of what you got to let go of. He's waiting for you to stop messing around with that sin. He's suffering long for, uh, for us. So we need to learn how to suffer long for others. God's love, if God's love is in us, we will be long-suffering to those people who hurt us, who annoy, who annoy us, right? Who irritate us. Come on. My God. <laughs> think, of some, think of somebody who was wronged by another. And, and they easily have the power to avenge themselves, right? But they will not do it out of mercy and patience. That's, that's long-suffering. When somebody did me wrong and I have, I could just get revenge. I have, I, I got opportunity to get them back, but I don't. But I don't because of mercy and patience. Amen. That's long suffering. Now, the next one, love is kind. Love is kind. When we have God's love, it shows through the simple acts of kindness we do. Do you even do, do we do simple acts of kindness? Well, if we don't, we should start doing simple acts of kindness for people. Sometimes I just, you know, the, when there's people, like, they ask for money at the, you know, at Walmart and stuff, I'll just give them some money, like, just a simple act of kindness, you know, because, and then my kids see that too, you know? I think that's cool because they learn to be kind, to be giving, to be loving, right? But a simple act of kindness. Nobody likes being around mean people. Come on, you like being around a mean person? Heck no, you, you're going to go the other way, right? Nobody likes being around mean people. If you're mean, don't expect anybody to receive from you or respond to you. Right? They, like I said, they're going to go the other way. Oh, she's mean. He's mean. I ain't, uh-uh. They're grumpy all the time. They're always, you know, yelling at people. Uh, I'm good. So be kind because ain't nobody going to receive from somebody who's mean. We, we have to be kind. We have to be tenderhearted. We have to be gentle towards one another. That's showing God's love. That's having God's love inside of us. Love does not envy. Ooh, I like this one. This is a good one. Envy. I think envy is a sin. Envy is a sin, huh, Pastor? Envy is a sin. And I looked up envy. It says a feeling of discontented or resentful longing aroused by someone else's possessions, qualities, or blessings. Come on, tell your neighbor, don't be a hater. Come on, don't be a hater. We shouldn't be hating on each other. We should be loving each other. We should be celebrating one another. If your brother or sister is prospering, if they're being blessed, if God is using them, amen, if God is exalting them, then you should be happy for them. You shouldn't be envious, amen? This is the most danger. This is one of the most dangerous sin to have. Jealousy. Mm. Hey, come on, shame the devil. Tell the truth. Tonight, tonight, you can repent if you've been feeling these type of ways. Amen? But it's true. It's a real thing. I felt it before, so I'm pretty sure a lot of you felt it before. But we got to, like, fight that. We can't allow that to overtake us. Amen? Because love, because all envy does is hurt people. And love is far from envy. If you got envy, you, love is like way over there. And, and we for sure know there ain't no love inside you if you're carrying around envy, right? Because love is far from envy. They do not go together. They cannot be together. You know? Love does not resent it when someone else is promoted or blessed. Love prefers others before themselves. How do you like it if somebody else is first before you? You know, like, you want to be first in line, right? We don't like it, right? We, wanna, we always want to be the first in line. Let me be the first one to get my plate of food, right? That's not love, though. <laughs> I know we do that a lot. I'm guilty of it. You know, we always want to be first. 
you know, but, but don't be hating on your brother or sister. If they just, if they're getting married, come on, some of y'all still waiting on your wife or your husband, right? Right, right, right. Or, if, you know, if they're getting blessed with a new job financially, no, we got to love them and celebrate them because that's how we're going to grow together in the house of God. That's how we're going to get to the next level. That's how we're going to reach more people in our city because they're going to see the love of God upon us. And let me say this real quick. It was envy. It was envy that had Abel murdered. It was envy that enslaved Joseph. And it was envy that put Jesus on the cross. In Matthew 27, 18, it says, For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. You know, the Pharisees were envious of our Jesus. And that's what put him on the cross. So, amen. And just for the sake of time, I'm almost done. But basically in closing, love is not puffed up. It's not big-headed. It's not arrogant or self-focused. Love always focuses on the needs of others. When someone is puffed up and parading themselves, it's simply rooted from pride. Come on. That's another dangerous sin to have, especially in the house of God. And the most dangerous pride to have, because there's different forms of pride, is spiritual pride. Mm. The pride of grace. You look all, you know, I'm, I'm graceful, I'm saved, I'm, I love Jesus. But deep down inside, you have pride. Deep, but, 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 you, but you don't look like it because you're, you're like, you're making everybody, you know, I'm a Christian, I read, I pray, I speak in tongues. I do all these great things for God, but inside, you, you struggle with pride inside. Come on, spiritual pride. Get rid of it. Come tell your neighbor, get rid of it. We got to get rid of it tonight. Tonight's the night, right? Love does not behave rudely. That one kind of speaks for itself. But again, we have to have kindness. We have to have good manners. Come on, you guys got good manners? We got to have good manners. Not, you know, being courteous to each other. If you have bad manners, then I don't know if you're really a Christian. I'm just going to say that. You know, I don't know because bad mannered people, like, that's not representing Christ. You know, that's misrepresenting our Lord. Amen. But love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. And I looked up the word in, uh, this word in the Greek, and it means all things. That's what it means. So I hope you guys got something out of this tonight. I hope that we're reminded that we need to love the way Jesus loved us. We need to love each other. Amen. And with that, I'm just going to pray out. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, God. I thank you once again, Lord. I pray that you would teach us, Lord, how to love, God, how to agape love one another, how to agape love the hurting, the broken, and the lost, God. Help us, Father God, to, to, to um, master this gift that we are given because it is the greatest gift that you have given us, Lord. And, and I just pray that we would be men and women of God who um, just take that to heart tonight. And I pray you be with my husband as he comes up and shares in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's give God some praise. All right. Amen. She stole my message. Amen. Well, well, um, I'm glad to be here tonight, and, you know, um, I just want to thank God for my salvation, and um, I just want to jump right into it, too. And uh, come on, let's give Cora one more hand clap of praise. Hand clap. How many of us know that we have to love? Amen. Love is so important, especially as Christians, right? And men of God, women of God, love is so key, so important, because that makes that that determines who we are or how people look at us is through love. Um, tonight, my name is Garrett, and I'm your friend. On the count of three, give me your name. One, two, three. Well, it's nice to meet you. 
And I'm glad that you're here tonight. Amen. So you can't say I didn't greet you guys. I did. Well, I want to thank God for my salvation. I want to thank um, Pastor Sister Sylvia once again for allowing us, uh, allowing my wife and I to be behind the pulpit tonight. Um, I want to thank my beautiful wife and my kids for supporting, um, just always backing me up, supporting me. I just want to thank my beautiful wife. And um, But today, I want to speak a message about having a mega mentality. You know, mega mentality is just thinking of yourself big. In the Greek, it's great, large, or mighty. And when I think about this, is this is what's happening in, in Victory Outreach International. Um, every time we go to, every time you could look it up, Pastor Sonny, even, you know, we just came back from the regional meetings, and it's always about expanding. He's always talking about growing. It's always about enlarging our capacity, enlarging our vision, expanding. Our ministry is evolving, right? We're growing. God has given our, our founders strategy to reach the world, and that's through the base concept. It's through team ministry. And, and, and you know, before, they would send couples out, right, to start a church like our pastors they came with the team, and they built the church from the ground up. Come on, let's give them a hand clap because I was a gang leader for three years, and I was like, man, I don't know how a pastor did it. <laughs> but it's, it's not easy running a church and being a leader and being committed and being here every day and showing up and, you know, all kind of things are happening and opposition, and you're still up here preaching your heart out. And that's what I see in our pastors right here. Amen. And I believe they... They, they need recognition, and I see that. I know my wife and I, we see that. And that's the leader that I'll follow because of his commitment and his heart and, and his love for God. Um, but that's, you know, and, and that's the way it started. But now it's all team concept. If you look at it, if, the, if you see where we're at, where, how we're evolving, now they're sending out teams. Now they're, they're, they're they want to, the way we're going to reach a country, the way we're going to take a nation is by base concept, Right? And some of this might be going over our head, but I'm going to get right into it, okay? My point is this, is that we're evolving, we're growing, we're, 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 we're expanding our mentality, right? Someone say mega. Even our verbiage is evolving. And I heard it tonight, so don't get mad at me. Our verbiage. In the third wave, there's certain words that I know that our international leader has come and told us that we can't say. It's not like... You can't say it or in a way like it's just our verbiage, right? How we say like if you look at the kids gang, they changed it to next gen. Come on. I don't know if you guys caught that one, but it's called next gen now. It's not kids gang. It's next gen. And when you look at the gang or, 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 or new gen, it's not the new gen or the kids gen. It's not, it's not high, high school. It's students right? Young adults. And that's the verbiage that's changing because we're evolving because we don't want to put a cap on the gang. We don't want to put a cap on the kids, right? That's the kids ministry. That's the youth ministry. No, it's that student and young adult ministry. Because when we use student, when we use um, youth, when we use kids, then that's basically putting a cap. And people look at it like, Oh, well, I don't want to get involved in the kids' ministry, you know? And I thank God for our founders because they're so intentional. And they want us to see the bigger picture. We want to evolve in our verbiage. We want to evolve in how we talk, how we speak. And this is what's taking place internationally. And I remember I was in San Jose and Pastor Ryan came. And he even said, saying words like little, tiny, or small are like low-key cuss words. Come on now. I know it ain't, but I'm going to explain why. For example, sometimes most of us, we're guilty of it. We say, we're going to have a little get-together. I'm going to get a little Jesus inside of me tonight. We're going to have a little meeting. We're going to have a little service. Some of you said that tonight. Don't raise your hand. We're going to have a little church. No, that's not our verbiage. It's today, 
going forward is, man, we're going to have a big meeting. You know, we're going to have a big prayer meeting. It might just be two of you, but you know what? We're going to have a mega meeting. We're going to have a mega men's home, women's home. We're going to have a mega life group. We're going to have a mega discipleship home. How this, how's this going to happen? It's going to happen by shifting our mentality. And something I try to tell people is, I don't care if there's one or two people in your ministry, you got to preach like there's 10 people or 100 people. And that's the mentality that we need to possess today. Enlarging our capacity, enlarging our vision, enlarging our mentality. And it all starts here at the local level. It all starts right here, right there in your ministry. I remember being over the Royal Rangers at one point, the security ministry at one point, and, and, and you know, over the Native Winds, and then, and then God elevated me to be a gang leader, and now my wife and I are regional leaders, and, you know, but it all started, and I worked my way up. And I thank God because every ministry, everything I got involved in, it taught me something. It taught me how to work with people. It taught me how to be patient. It taught me how to put a mission statement together. It taught me how to have vision, how to build team, how to work and how to love and how to forgive and how to continue to go forward no matter what's happening. But it's important that we have that, that it all starts right here. So don't despise the humble beginnings. Don't despise where you're at because, man, God sees where you're at. God notices everything, but everything we go through, it's all a process, and it's, you know, God has something, and God is doing something. If you believe that, come on, give him a hand clap. Some of you are like, man, he hasn't prayed in yet. I haven't forgot. Um, but anyways, for us to enter into our new building, does anybody still pray about our new building? Does anybody still have it in the forefront, Right? The way for us to enter into our new building is going to take this type of mentality. Mentality. Having a mega mentality. Right? To see our church grow. To see our, our loved ones saved. To see our ministries grow. To, 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 be a success, to be successful in our ministry. In finances. In everything we, we do. We have to have a mega mentality. We have to have a big mentality. We have to shift our mentality. Because it's not going to. It's not going to work if only Pastor, Sister Sylvia are the only ones with this mentality. It's going to take us. It's going to take the church. It's going to take even myself. How we, how, what's, going to, what's going to shift our mindset? The Word of God. Prayer. Being committed to the cause. Right? No matter what's going on in our lives, that we stay committed. Tell your neighbor, are you committed? And there's so much more that I could add, but today... I want to speak on where the mega, mega mentality comes from is from the Word of God. I'm a firm believer that when you, when you believe the Word of God, when you meditate on the Word of God, when you internalize the Word of God, it boosts the power, it boosts you, it gives you a boost, and it gives you a power inwardly. And then you begin to believe, you know what, God? I can't stand on this pulpit, and I can't preach to hundreds and fifties and thousands of people. You know what, God? You know, I'm going I'm to dress up. I'm going to get my, my act together. I'm going to go to this job, and I'm going to stand up for what I believe. That's having a mega mentality when you begin to internalize the word of God. I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for me dissecting the word of God building my relationship with God if it wasn't for me getting into the Word of God and, and internalizing it and meditating on it and chewing on it. And that's what gave me the confidence. That's what gave me the boldness. I was only maybe a week saved, and I felt God tugging me to the pulpit. Like, And I'm not the person to be behind, or I'm not the person look at me. right? I was just like, I'm good. I'll be in the background. I'm not trying to be all up front and showing, you know, being... Being a, being a spokesman or being a, being a, being on the front. But I just knew that this was God's calling upon my life. And this is where I am today. Amen. But I'm going to read a scripture right here in Romans chapter 2 verse, verse 1 and 2. It says, I beseech you. Someone say, I beseech you. I beseech you, therefore. And this is the Apostle Paul writing a letter to the Roman church. 
In other words, he's saying it's a polite call, also a demand, a call, if you will. He's saying, I beseech you. He's saying it politely, but at the same time, he's saying it insistent, uh, insisting. Like, look, I want to come at you and I want to tell you, but at the same time, I want to let you know. I want to make it, this is important. This is necessary. You have to understand that what I'm telling you, I want to come to you in the right way, the right approach, but please understand what I'm trying to tell you. I'm just getting into it, okay? Brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Someone say, be transformed. By the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We love you. We ask right now, you just... We just ask for the anointing and the unctioning of your Holy Spirit, God, to just come in this place, God. Lord, let me decrease as you increase. Take control. Lord God, let every heart be open and receptive to everything that you're going to share tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name, we all say, amen. He says, I invite you. He says, I invoke you. Paul is mentioning here. He's, 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 he's um, mentioning, hear me now. I need you to hear me, your mind needs to be washed. Your mind needs to be renewed. Paul is saying, not only does he want us to, not, not only does he want us to give our bodies, right, but also our minds. Because like my wife said, a lot of us, we could come up, we could serve, we could, you know, give our time, we could do everything we do, but a lot of times we stay stuck because we don't, allow our minds to be renewed. We still have the same mindset. We still trip over the same things. We're, we're, we're in bondage and we're enslaved to our mind. And the way we're going to break those bondages, the way we're going to break those shackles, the way we're going to break that mentality is the Word of God. Tell your neighbor the Word of God. Fasting and praying and Man, I know my mind was all messed up, and I used to repeat this scripture. Man, God, renew my mind, God. Change the pattern of my mind. Man, God, I don't want to think the same. I don't want my mind to go, go through the same thing I went through as a kid, God. I want to change my mindset. And a lot of times our mind doesn't change because our minds thought a certain way for, for a long time. For me, I got saved at 21 years old, so my mind was was had a pattern and had a way of thinking for 21 years until God came into my life. And that's where I began to read the Word of God. I remember my home director in Chicago, he was like, man, Garrett, why, you're always praying about your mind because, man, my mind's all messed up. And I tell God, man, God, change my mind. Break that pattern of my mind. Give me a new mind. Renew my mind. Man, God, I need a brainwash. But it was through the word of God and standing on the word of God and being persistent. And that's the way we're going to shift that mentality. That's the way we're going to be able to see bigger. That's the way we're going to possess that mega mentality. Because we can't, God's not going to give us our building if we're not shifting. If we're not shifting our mindset, if we're not adapting, if we're not evolving, if we're not growing. Because pastor can't do it on his own. The front, the front row can't do it on their own. The women core leadership can't do it on their own. It has to be from the front to the back, from the left to the right. Everybody here on board, shifting. Everybody on board, growing, evolving. And that's the way I believe that God is going to let us enter into the promised land, into our new building. Come on, if you believe that, shout for Jesus. I beseech you, therefore, do not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. God is asking us to shift our mentality because he has something bigger. He has something greater. I thank God that I shift my mind. I thank God I still got to shift my mind today because there's so much things that God has in store. But if I didn't shift, if I didn't change, if I didn't evolve, if I didn't grow, if I wasn't challenged, then I wouldn't be where I am today. 
I walked out of my house a month ago, or it was recent, or like maybe beginning the end of last year, and I was just at all, and I was just amazed, like, man, God, you got me in South Reno. Man, God, you got me around all these people that I'm not even used to being around. But it's because I broke those bondages. I broke those shackles. I broke that mentality, that poverty mentality, that depressed mentality. And I began to aim for the stars because that's what I was taught. It's to aim for the stars. And if you don't, then you're going to land on the moon. But at least you're going somewhere. And I took chances. I took risks. I put my foot in my mouth, I got rebuked, I got chopped up, but I continue to go forward, I continue to not give up, I continue to press on, I continue to serve God. God is asking us to shift our mentality. If you read that scripture, he says, I beseech you by the mercies of God, right? And he says, present your body a living sacrifice, I beseech you, Reno, I beseech you, my brother, my sisters here tonight, do not conform to this world. I'm asking you politely, but at the same time, I'm demanding you, and I'm letting you know, don't conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. God is insisting, God is demanding politely that we shift our mentality. And the only way you're going to shift your mentality, it's not by just fellowship and coming and this is good. But it has to be an inward change. It has to be something you internalize. It has to be a word or a promise or something you stand on, something you repeat. And I used to repeat. And there's a scripture I always remember and I tell everybody is that the, the 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. I'm a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. When you begin to read that scripture and you begin to just meditate on it and chew on it and repeat 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 it, I kid you not, it begins to make sense. Some of you can say it once and it makes sense and it's obvious, right, what it's saying. But what I'm trying to teach you is you got to internalize it. Because you say it once, then it probably ain't going to get into you. It's not going to get, get, get internalized. It's not going to be written on your heart. But when you begin to internalize it, when you begin to chew on it, when you begin to believe it, when you begin to see that, man, you know, I'm a man of God. I'm a woman of God. I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not, I'm, I don't drink no more. I'm not an alcoholic no more. I'm not this, not no, that no more, right? We begin to understand. We begin to internalize the word of God. Our mentality begins to shift. Because some of us, God has so much in store for you, but he's waiting for you to shift. He's waiting for you to make that change. He's waiting for that inward change to take place within your heart and your mind. The word transfer in the Greek is metamorphosis. To change, transfigure, transform, to change into another form. And most of you probably know this. You probably learned it in school or you did an experience, 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 experiment, sorry. A metamorphous examples include most insects, tadpole, that change into a frog, a toad, and many aqu aquatic species such as fish. A popular example is when a caterpillar metamorphosizes into a papoon and then a butterfly. You guys understand that, right? You guys know. I remember we did it when I was like in middle school or, and I remember we did an experiment with that. But when you look at it, the stage is a stage of development right before adulthood. A butterfly, a moth is known as a some kind of insects go through a dramatic instinct stages as they grow, otherwise known as a metamorph metamorphosis. So what am I saying to you guys is shifting our mentality, shifting our mindset. We need that metamorphosis experience to take place spiritually, to take place mentally, to take place physically. Come on, somebody. From mature thinking, from immature thinking to mature thinking. From small thinking to mega thinking. 
from neighborhood ghetto mind thinking to a man of God to a woman of God thinking. Depleting complexes, depleting inadequacies, and putting our faith and trust in God. Look, coming, having a local mentality, mentality to a global mentality. I remember when I was young and I was in my car and I was getting high and I was smoking some weed and I was right there drinking. And I always thought, man, I could never, this is my life. And I could, you know, this is, you know, I'm too deep in this. Like, in my small-minded thinking, I was like, I'm too deep in this. I can't change my family, everything I know. I couldn't see beyond where I grew up at. Right there in Arizona, the reservation. I couldn't see beyond what God was doing. I couldn't see beyond the reservation where I grew up at, but I realized when I was in the home, and as I look back at that time, now I was like, man, I just had a, I was so in bondage, I was so enslaved to my mind, to my mentality, because of the environment I grew up in, because of what I, the, the people around me, it kept me down, it kept me bound, and I couldn't see myself leaving where I was at. I couldn't see myself going to college. I couldn't see myself becoming a business owner. I couldn't see myself as coming a, a man of God. I couldn't see myself doing something positive because of all the negativity. All they said, you're going to be an alcoholic just like your dad. One of my uncle told me, you're not going to be nobody. You're not going to be nothing. You're not going to amount to nothing. And that's all I believed. And I ran with it until God knocked me off my high horse till God brought my auntie and God brought my grandma and God brought my mom and all these women of God that were praying for me. And all of a sudden, God just put a, a, a he just touched my heart. And I could get into that testimony, but I want to keep going forward. But God began to open up my mind. God began to change my mentality God began to help me to see different, and I always thought, like, man, why couldn't I have thought, like, planned a trip when I was in high school, or why couldn't I have said, hey, you know what, let's go to New York, let's go to Chicago, you know, and I never thought like that, and I got an opportunity to go to Chicago, and it was a blessing, that was the first time I ever got on an airplane, I went to Chicago, I went to the, we landed, we are ready to leave, we go outside the doors and outside the, 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 the plane station. or the, And when we went outside, I felt like I, I went back in time. Like I literally, because it was a whole different culture. It was a whole different atmosphere. It was something different. It was something new. And I wasn't familiar with it. I, it was all new to me because I've never, all I've been around was the Southwest, Arizona. I went to California a couple times and just the Southwest is all I knew. Until I got to go to Chicago and God began to expand my mentality. When I go to these, these international events, like Pastor and I, we went to Guadalajara where they opened up the new building. We went into that new building and man, that building, that convention center is massive. Massive. The women of God will see it when you guys go there in a couple weeks, right? But when I went there and then I came back here, I was like, man, our building's small. Because of the exposure, because of what God was showing me, God began to expand my mentality. God began to open up my mind. When I went to these conferences, God began to, God to put a fire inside of me, man. I could be like that man of God. I could preach like that man of God. Because, man, he came from the same background I come from. And he began to boost confidence inside of me. It was an inward change started to take place inside of me. And I wanted to step into that. I wanted to be who God called me to be. I wanted to think bigger. I wanted to think different. I didn't want to just get stuck. Is there anybody stuck? I began to internalize the word of God. Internalize the word of God. I don't know what time I started, so whenever the piano comes up, I'll close. You see, scriptures such as this is... Scriptures that we need to internalize. John 14, 12 says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these will he do, will we do, because I go to the Father. Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things. Someone say, I can do all things. 
I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Romans chapter 8 verse 37. Yet in all these things we are more. Someone say we are more than conquerors through him. Who is him? That's Jesus. That's Jesus. That's our big brother. That's the king of kings and the Lord of lords through him. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. 1 John 4.4 4 says, He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. It's time to shift our mentality, Reno. It's time to have that meta, metamorphosis process needs to take place from immature thinking to mature thinking to a mature mindset. If you want to title this message, Mega Mentality. That was just my intro. Really, that was. Someone who talks big isn't full of pride. They're full of promise. They're full of God. They got a relationship with God. Why do we need a, why do we need a metamorphosis experience to happen? Why do we need a change, transform the way we think? Because where God is taking us, it's required. You think about it in the business world. You want to elevate. You want to become a CEO. You want to, you think they're going to, you think they're going to, they're going to accept someone that doesn't dress well. Someone doesn't brush their teeth. Someone that doesn't know how to work with another coworker, someone that doesn't know the business, someone that doesn't know the processes, someone that doesn't, they're gonna, they're gonna, they're, the ones that are gonna get, get promoted are the ones that dress well, the ones that know the job, that know the systems, that know the processes, that know how to, that knows the vision of the company, that knows the vision and the direction of where this company is going. Those are the ones that are gonna elevate. Because their mindset's changing, because they're evolving, they're growing, their mentality's expanding. And that's the same way, if we want to step into this new building, then our mentality needs to evolve. We can't have that poverty mentality, that ghetto mentality. Those are things we got to pray out. We got to get it out of us, get it out of ourselves. And it's going to take consistency. It's going to take standing on the word of God. Sometimes it's going to take crying. Because I kid you not, there's times where I felt like, there's times I got to the point of crying. Because I was like, man, God changed my mind. And I'm over here stalking myself and, you know, like hitting and, and like, man, I don't want to think the way I think. I want to be different, God. I don't want to think the same way I'm thinking because I get depressed. I get angry. I just start getting frustrated with myself. And I began to just stand on the word of God. And even today, I continue to stand. I continue to internalize. I continue to re re repeat scripture. I continue to meditate on scripture. Where God has taken us, it's required. It's required. I beseech you, Viorino, students, young adults, OGs, everybody here, that we have to change. We have to evolve. We have to grow. We have to step up to the to step up to that next level, step into the calling, the purpose that God has for your life. We don't need no more. We don't need no bystanders. We don't need no curious Christians. Right? A lot of times we have all the negative things to say about our leader, then you step up. And you see how challenging it is, challenging it is. You see how difficult it is. You see all the demons and devils that we got to fight. You're just in your cocoon. And you're afraid to expand your mentality because you're comfortable and you're stuck. And you don't want to grow. You don't want to move. You want to, you want to stay where you're at. But God is calling you out tonight, my brother, my sister. I beseech you by the mercies of God that you, that you allow God to transform your mind. That you allow God to get into your heart. That you begin to internalize the word of God. Like I said, in the business world, the systems that you got will get you to where you are now. And eventually, it's going to evolve. What got you to 550000 
what got you to 100,000, what got you to 500,000. And as you continue to grow, as you continue to elevate, your systems, your processes, your mindset has to change to sustain the growth that you want to see. It happens in everything. How are we going to step into our new building if we still have that same mindset? If we're still stuck? If we're still, if we still have that same mindset as last year? If we're still down, if we're still not even involved in ministry? I want to close with this scripture. If we can all stand. I have a question for you, Vio Reno. Do you want to stay stuck? Do you want to be at the same place next year? Do you want to grow? Do you want to be a part of what God is doing right now? Then I want to tell you, fulfill your pledge. If you have even pledged, I would challenge you to pledge. I would challenge you to get behind us. We want to step into a new building. And not only that, it's time to grow. It's time to elevate. It's time to take our, take our reading life to another level. It's time to get up in the morning and pray. It's time to get into the word of God. It's time to shift our mentality. Proverbs 23.7 says, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. We come from messed up backgrounds. And sometimes those are things that keep us bound, that keep us locked in, or keep us from progressing or advancing and elevating and growing. But it's time to shake those things off. The way I did it, I went to a mountaintop and I cried my lungs out. I used to live right next to one and I would go up there and I would cry out to God. I would cry out to God. I would get desperate because I didn't want to be the same. I didn't want to go back to alcohol. I didn't want to go back to the damage and to the vomit and to all the negative things I came from. I wanted to grow because I knew God had a calling upon my life and I began to stand and on the word of God and the promises and, and the plan, the calling that God had upon my life. But it's important where we come from, we have to understand God has something for you. And the only thing that's going to break those bondages, the only thing that's going to break those things from our past is God in your life. I can't say no anything, uh, anything else because I never tried anything else. I tried a lot of things, but it didn't work. But I know that I've been saved for 13 plus years going forward. I just turned 36 years old just a couple days ago. But this is the longest I've ever been sober. This is the longest I've ever done something right, right for myself and for my family. This is the longest I ever did this, but it's because of God in my life. So a man thinketh, so is he. When you think of God and when you think of love, when you think of vision when you think that you know I'm gonna do something great for God then that's what you're gonna do because it's inside of your heart and some of us we need to we need to when we open up these altars we need to cast out those negative thoughts those negative things that keep you bound those strongholds those generational curses I want to close with this with this story I have we're at a we're in 2023 we're at Puerto Vallarta where there was a regional meeting and I got to get in to a room with Pastor Sonny and all some of the multis the regionals they were there and Pastor Sonny started imparting and he asked one of the pastors a question he asked what kind of church are you he replied we're a musical church he said what else it's the most important and and he asked another pastor what type of church do you have and he said we're a base not a church we're a mega church and Pastor Sonny said yes that's, 
he asked another question, why are you a mega church? And he got us thinking mega. He said, why do we need to start thinking mega? When you see the churches around you, they're like satellite churches. And I realized he was shifting our mentality to think mega. And my point is this is, you might not, we might think that we don't have the goods. We might think that, you know, I come from the least of my family. I was the black sheep in my family. But you have to shift your mentality. So you know what? I'm a man of God. I'm a woman of God. I'm a woman, man of destiny. You know, God's called me. I'm born for greatness. I don't care what my family told me. I don't care what people are telling me right now. I'm born for greatness. I'm going to rock white right with the Lord. I'm going to do my best to do everything that the Lord wants me to do. I want to be obedient to his word. And I guarantee you, when you begin to shift your mindset, when you begin to erase the negative thoughts and you put positive thoughts, then those are the things that are going to begin to come alive in you. Those are the things that are going to become inside of you. They're going to become internalized inside of you. It's time to shift our mentality. It's time to look different. It's time to get into the word of God. It's time to believe the promises. It's time to say, you know what? I am a preacher. I am a man of God. I am a pastor's wife. No, I am a business owner. You know, I'm going to go to college. But it's all about what you think and how you perceive and your view and your perspective. But tonight, like I said, I beseech you, Vio Reno Church. That you renew your mind. That you allow God to shift your mind. Because he's asking you politely. But at the same time he's demanding it. Why? Because he has something greater for you. He has something better for you. But it's up to us. At this time we're just going to open up these altars. Amen. We're going to get a hold of God. As the worship team sings. Lord we pray. some shifting right now continue to worship him oh, continue to pray oh. this has to happen consistently this has to happen every day oh, if you want that shift if you want God to do a transformation
for you. us when we needed him the most but for some you may not feel rescued and it's okay because tonight what we're going to do is we're going to turn our lives over to Christ we have an opportunity for our names to be written in the Lamb's book of life and that's why we come to church that's why we worship hey Jesus. We're glad you were able to join us today. And if that message ministered to your heart, we want to lead you in a prayer of salvation. Just repeat this prayer after me. Just say, Dear Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died and resurrected on the third day and that you now sit at the right hand of the